Absolutely. Just uh, wanted to welcome everybody to, uh, to the, to the idea technology training sessions. This is the first one. It'll be an uh, intro, uh, and uh, Greg will go through a uh, number of things here, and then uh, be happy to uh, talk about, dis discuss, and uh, make this as interactive as we can. So please, if you have questions at any time, feel free to jump in. So, yep. uh, yeah, you want to take it away, Greg? Yeah, sure. Um, so this is adapted from a talk I wrote, actually, I think in 2018, when I was going on tour trying to promote more people to get into set testing. Um, and I've updated it some, but forgive me if there are any oddities. Um, and this is, I think we got an hour scheduled for this. This is not going to take an hour. So like Josh said, if you have any questions, just like, um, I, I guess, just speak up. Or if you're not comfortable doing that, then put a question in chat. Or I think we have a raise hand functionality. So... I'm sure Josh can interrupt me if you don't want to do that on your own. Um, but yeah, so we'll get going. Um, so um, this is about testing Seth, which we mostly do with our Tuthology framework. Um, Tuthology actually meet, is like an academic field. It's the study of cephalopods, um, the octopi and squid that we named our product after. Um, and Tuthology is, in the neighborhood of 10 years old. Um, we needed to formalize step testing because we didn't really have a good test system back then. Um, I, on more than one occasion, would like run a file system suite against CephFS and discover a bug and then go dig it down and realize and, and, and discover that like there was this if statement that was wrong and then flip it to, you know, with, with a not to be the other way around or something. But then realized when I went to commit it that we'd actually flipped this if statement back and forth two or three times over the last six months, depending on which test we'd run most recently. Um, so we really needed something stronger that we could run like on a regular basis and track results with and, and, and write test cases to cover specific scenarios when we discovered issues to make sure that we didn't regress. Um, and at that time, there weren't really any good testing systems for any good test frameworks for distributed systems. Um, so we had hired a guy who had a lot more experience than me at the time, and he decided this is a problem that needed solving, and so he took a go at it. And the first try involved auto test, which I think is used mostly for Linux kernel stuff, which is, you know, we had a Linux kernel module and sort of how we got in, got in, how we like discovered it and got into it. Um, but it was unsuccessful because it was really designed for like doing stuff on a machine. And we need to be able to manipulate multiple machines at once when we're testing staff because, you know, we have clients and servers and sometimes they restart in different times. Um, and you can sort of see mocking this up with KVM, but if we could just have different servers, it would be a lot easier. And even with KVM, we need, we need a way to like talk to the different VMs as if they're independent. Um, so we wrote a system. It is based on an orchestra communications module in Python, and all of Tuthology is written in Python, um, except for a few ancillary things that we do in Shell or whatever. Um, and orchestra, which if you write Tuthology tests, you'll probably not ever actually interact with directly, um, except for in the way on the right, where we do cluster.run. Um, but orchestra is a thing that wraps SSH and lets us, you know, nicely execute commands on remote machines and connect to them and do things to them. Um, and Tuthology started as just a test runner. It's more today, but its first thing was we would give it tasks um, and a list of target nodes to run them on and what roles that the tasks used were, like, were assigned to those targets. Um, and so it would like automatically configure the machines in terms of installing, in terms of like, you know, connecting to them and installing packages. Um, and it would let us do some kind of health monitoring to make like to make sure that the set demons are still running. And then it would execute the tests and grab the like, you know, set debug logs and core dumps and and system logs that we cared about and things and then clean those nodes back up so they could be used again by somebody else. Um, so targets are literally just a list of machines. Um, and so we just like, you know, it's the, like we, we still use the Ubuntu user because way back when this was all Ubuntu um, and we had machines called sepia, 
located in our little Ceph section of um, DreamHost incubated Ceph back then. So that's why these are on dreamhost.com. Um, roles, oh, I did make it there, hang on. So roles just say, hey, we have three monitors and there's one on each machine. Um, but on the first machine, we wanna have a monitor and an MDS and an OSD. Um, and those roles get assigned to the targets. And then we have a list of tasks that we wanna execute um, that, actually, that actually sort of make up the, the test system. Um, and each of these lines, or each of these top level lines is its own test, um, or sorry, it's, its own task. Um, so, you know, it's very important that we actually turn on the Ceph cluster. And so we have a task called Ceph that does that. Um, and the K client task will takes as a parameter this list of clients, in this case, just the one, um, and mounts the kernel client on that machine against the previously created Ceph cluster. And then we have a task called work unit, which is for executing shell scripts, which we call work units, which are in the Ceph.git repository. And we're telling that work unit that we have a have, that we want to run it on all of the clients, and the work unit we want it to run is in the suites folder and it's called dbench.shell. Um, um, in Python technical terms, these tasks can be context managers. So the Ceph one, um, and, and what that means is that it's sort of broken up into an execution phase, and then um, and then it yields and lets other things happen. Um, so the Ceph task, um, sorry, and and then once and then once you return control to that task, then it does its teardown. So the Ceph task turns on a Ceph cluster, and then it yields, and you get to do other things like mount a kernel client, which then yields, and then we can, in this case, run auto tests, which I don't think exists anymore, and interactive, um, which is a test fragment that simply pauses execution so that you can go log into machines. Um, and then you, I think, control D it to say, all right, I'm done now. Um, and then it returns. But then once control passes back to the kernel client, its teardown functionality is to unmount, and the Ceph tasks teardown functionality is to shut down a Ceph cluster. Um, and this is, you know, um, because you know a Ceph cluster is a big running thing, and we want to clean up politely. Um, in, it, in addition to just being polite, we want to like make sure that we shut down successfully, and that we don't have bugs when when um, Ceph programs shut down that cause crashes that make people unhappy and things like that. Um, so, Qtology tests are defined in terms of YAML, and in particular, Qtology is set up to be convenient because as you saw before, we had the um, the tar targets and the tasks and the roles, and those can all be individual little bits of incomplete YAML that the Qtology system glues together into one complete, into one complete test execution environment. Um, so it's harder to do this today with the permissions we have set up, but you can just execute Qtology directly with a list of fragments that are on your local machine and, and a location to archive them at. And those pieces get glued together into one file that looks something like this. Um, this is a very simple one. They're a lot longer now, but this would still function at a basic level where we say, hey, use these three machines, give them these sets of roles, and execute our tasks to run a test. And then when the test is done, you end up with a log folder that looks something like this, where we have our configuration that you started with, which is just the glued together bits of YAML, and then a, fold, a remote folder, which has logs from all of the machines, um, and a summary saying whether the test passed or not, and the log of the actual Tuthology execution with the debug and information logging that you put in the Python code itself. Um, now, of course, it's bad if you collide with other developers who are running tests. So Tuthology, we have a lock server that lets you grab machines um, and lock them for your own use. And then Tuthology won't give them out to other people or try and schedule things on them. Um, and it's a simple call. You say, hey, I want to lock some servers. Um, so Smithy is the machine type. 
we have a couple different machine types we'll talk about in a bit. Um, and the technology lock command just gives you back a, li a list of targets, which you can conveniently pipe into a file and use as a targets.yaml. Um, in addition to running ta tasks or running jobs directly from the command line on your own machine out to technology or out to the lab, you can schedule things. Um, which and when you schedule things that puts jobs into a beanstalk DQ at the moment, although we might be changing that in the future. Um, and those jobs are just grabbed and executed. Um, and then the results get stored and you can get an email back if you want, if you included an email address when it's done, or you can just watch it. Um, so that's the very, very simplest way to use Tutology from a decade ago. It's not actually how we use it now though, because you know combining all these fragments is kind of a pain um, and not scalable. So we have suites of Tutology tests. Um, Suites are in the sep.get folder in the QA slash suites directory. Um, and they're just a bunch of pieces of YAML fragments that we use to form complete jobs. Um, as an example, if you list the Rados Verify folder, you get back results that look something like this. Um, this is a listing a couple years ago and, go, and it's pruned, so it'll be somewhat different, but it's sort of the basic idea. Um, so at the top level of any given subsuite folder, or sorry, so Rados is a whole suite and Verify is a subsuite inside of it, and you can have arbitrarily nested subsuites um, if you want to specify, make, run smaller groups. Um, but within any given folder, um, then we will run any files at the top level, get stuck together, and any folders will grab a piece out of them. Um, to combine into suites. And we'll do all the combinatorial combinations um, of those of those fragments to that we can to get a whole thing. Um, and the reason for that is because it makes it really easy to, for instance, say, hey, we have a new blue store allocator, or hey, we have we have this new option in that we've created in Rados, and we want to run all of our existing tests with it on and with it off. Um, and so rather than have to go through and modify all of the tests, you can just create a new folder for Blue Store or a new folder for your particular option with a YAML fragment that has it on and a YAML fragment that has it off and not have to worry about whether your coverage is good, you just know it's good. Um, so when you, when you run Tutology Suite against the, thing, against the folder structure that looks like this, it will always include the Ceph and Rados.yaml files. Um, and this cluster is one of the special case we'll get back to. Um, and then it'll say, okay, so we have this dthrash folder and we have a, and we have two, two YAMLs inside of it, um, but we're gonna run with the default one first. And we have this object store folder and we'll grab the blue store bitmap.yaml and in this task, we'll run mon recovery. Um, and that's one job. But then, you know, there's a whole bunch of other files. So we'll walk through it and we'll say, all right, we'll run the same configuration, but we'll run the Rados API test fragment against it. And they class all, Rados class all fragment against it. Um, and then, hey, we've done all of those combinations with the original setup. So now we'll move on to a new object store configuration um, and schedule them on recovery against it, um, add infinitum. Um, there is one special thing. Um, this plus is actually a, like file in the file system. And it's saying that rather than grabbing one file at a time, I want you to glue them to, I just want you to use all of them and glue them together. Um, and we do that for things like suites where a, a subsuite, you know, has bits of information we want to add together um, on and run on every single thing, but without changing them. So like this, this fix 2.yaml is actually a symlink to a yeah, we'll fragment we use in a lot of different places. So we don't want to modify that. But for these tests, we have a little bit of extra information we want. So we just help to glue it together. Does that make any sense to anybody? Can someone say they're okay with it? Yes, it's okay. <laughs> okay. Um, you have any questions on that? Now is the time. <laughs> so we're going to move on. Okay. Um, so. 
this is definitely no longer a complete set of suites, but we have a whole lot of different suites that cover a lot of different pieces of functionality against the Ceph code base. Um, so, you know, it's reasonably comprehensive. Um, we also have this really interesting th thing within the suites called Thrashers. Um, and if you've ever read about the Netflix Chaos Monkey, our Thrashers are Chaos Monkeys. Um, they turn nodes on and off, or in the case of this one, they oh, oops, they grow and shrink the number of PG PGs that the, that the Rados pool is involved have um, just randomly by running in the background as you do other things. This is useful because it lets us simulate all the random things that happen to Ceph clusters while people are using them um, and make sure that the cluster continues to you know, satisfy its contracts, despite the fact these changes are happening. Um, so, yeah. Uh, is there is there any uh, deterministic way to run freshers to be able to go back to a failure, a, a seed that can be determined for the randomness or whatever? Um. Most of them have seeds, but if you want to, but like there's so many things that go into the timing of any given failure on a stuff cluster that your odds are not great. Um, if you have a specific sequence of events, um, you can write tests designed to trigger them, possibly by modifying the stuff code. Um, so, for instance, in in the in the MDS for the file system, then we have a sequence of of um of configuration options that lets you just assert out at critical points and and some of the tutology tests do things like set these config options so that when you migrate data between mds's we can set a config option equal to a number and just step through failing at every single step in the migration process um, but just like, you know, we're doing things against a hard drive. So being able to run a seed on, you know, killing nodes randomly or or changing the number of PGs just isn't that helpful because hard drives take however long they take to answer questions. Okay, thanks. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that was an overview of suites. Um, and so the basic methodology, but that's most like, all that stuff with the Tuthology schedule or running it directly is not really how you interact with it much today. Um, so today, Tuthology, there are people outside of this like step upstream, us running Tuthology in their own labs, but we run it in the CPA lab, which is, you know, a community lab devoted to Ceph. It's hosted at Red Hat and has machines from several different companies that have been donated. Um, and we just got a new edition of Gibbon nodes which is some kind of cephalopod, I don't know what. Um, but most of them are SSD based. We still have some hard drive based ones from many years ago. And it's just devoted to running Ceph tests all the time. And SSH access is granted to engage developers, um, which is I think most of the people I see on this list, but if you you know contribute a couple of ERs, you can get granted SSH access. Um, and what you actually execute is not Tuthology schedule or Tuthology, but Tuthology suite to run one of those suites like the example we looked at. Um, and let's see. Right, so this is one that I happened to run last month or something, but I just went through my my um, shell history to find, a, find an example command. Um, and so when you run Tuthology Suite, then you are specifying let's see, a particular suite to run. The stash us Rado says run the Rado suite. Um, and I'm running it on a particular set of machines, the smithing ones in this case, and I am drawing a particular package. Um, this is a branch called whip stretch updates, which is in the cefci.git repository. Um, we'll talk a little more at the end about where these packages come from, but we have this thing that builds packages. Um, and I want to use the version of the suite, which is located at the same place. Um, and I don't want to run all the suites. We'll talk about subsets, but I'm, I'm, I'm shrinking the size of it. Um, 
But this particular command goes off and generates the Rados, the set of jobs in the Rados suite and puts those jobs into the queue, which is still Beanstalk D, and then you know eventually they get executed. Um, so you know, two or three years ago, there were 148 SSH keys. There are more now. Um, and to get a build, you push a branch to cefci.git. And then you execute a sweet command like the longer example I gave you. And then the results become available at our Popito website. Um, these suites are run by individual developers working on a particular feature. Um, but then, you know, we get pull requests from ourselves and from outside contributors and the tech leads and reviewers will look at PRs and then build integration branches, put gluing a bunch of them together and run those through the suites to check for issues. Um, and we have a bunch of nightlies that run, you know, once a week or once a, or once a day or, or scheduled once a week or once a day or whatever, and hopefully run the same day um, against our stable branches and master and various other things. Um, Yuri, who's on the call mostly does that. Um, and then we go over the results. Um, so there are other frameworks used to test Ceph besides Suthology that you should be aware of. Um, some of our other projects have their own tests that are written in Tox and run inside of Jenkins. Um, we have unit tests that you can run locally by running make check and those also execute um, every time anyone pushes a PR. Um, let's see, the Ceph object corpus thing that I've highlighted is a set of examples of all the things that Ceph stores on disk um, from every version that we've made, or at least most of the versions we released. And this is how we automatically make sure that our code can always read the disk state that might exist um, when we do upgrades and stuff. Um, and there are a few bits that I sort of hinted at, but I haven't discussed a bunch yet. So, um, Tuthology suites have gotten huge. Three years ago, the Rado suite was already up to over 124,000 jobs. It's much, much larger now because we're just, you know, when we add new options, we double the size of the suite saying, hey, you know, like I want to run everything against this. Um, or at least we double the size of, you know, a big group of it. Um, and so that's too many jobs to actually run on a regular basis. Um, so there's this thing called subsets func functionality. Um, and you can, and when you use it, run a subset, you specify, you know, a numerator is which number of the subset in the denominator is how many subsets you're saying there will be. Um, this is this is a lie. We don't actually like run all 500 subsets against any given um, build, but we're saying. If we assume that we had 500 subsets and across that 500, we wanted to run every single combination of them, um, then just give me a subset that touches all of it, that uses all the YAML fragments in at least one test, um, but does not run literally all of them in every possible combination against each other. And then as time goes on, we can, we can you know, iterate this number or we can iterate the numerator to step through and run different combinations. Um, so the nightlies will each run, I don't know what the cycle is anymore, it might be two weeks, um, but the nightlies, you know, run like iterate through to, to eventually get all the combinations. Um, and when you're building a branch, then you will change the numerator, or when you're like building and testing a branch, then you'll change the new, then you wanna change the numerator every time you schedule a new run against new code or whatever. Um, just to try and get all the possible coverage, but this still gives us a good subsample of the coverage. Um, in addition to the subset, you can filter out, you can filter to specific pieces, like if you're making a blue store change, well, no, that's not a good example. Um, if you're making a change to the monitors, you might not care about specific things. So you can say, hey, I only wanna test things that include this option, um, or you can filter out, filter out specific sorts of jobs. Um, the name of a test is actually just a concatenation of all the YAML fragment file names. Um, um, and so this is a good way to leave specific things out. And then you can, if you have test failures, you can rerun 
to only hit those test failures in a new attempt. With or not a new attempt. Line, with the same uh, uh, command line, just uh, uh, adding the rerun? Um, mostly, yes. I've had it fail a few times, needed to go poke at things. Uh, I, I think I think Yuri is probably the one you want to talk to if you have issues with it, but but that's how it's supposed to work. Okay, thanks. Yeah, usually you can use a simpler command line, just referring to the um, archive directory of the previous run and say rerun exactly what these this run did. Huh. Um, um, so if you actually want to run a test, uh, you need to build the packages, which means which is you know not too hard you push the branch to the stuff ci.git repository and then you wait <laughs> for them to be built um and then you schedule the right suites against it so again here's a command i ran in my history um it's basically the same it's what i showed you before um but i added a few more things so first of all i'm running i i made the subsequent denominator very very large because this produces in the neighborhood of like 450 tests now <laughs> um and I guess I was up to number nine. Um, and I said, okay, I actually don't care about jobs that are testing the dashboard or Ceph ADM because I'm making the kind of change that is exceedingly unlikely to damage those. Um, and the dash P is setting an, is setting a priority. Um, this is a weakness of our existing test scheduling infrastructure. Um, it priority um, puts things into Beanstalk uh, um, just in a strict order. So I'm saying, hey, this is an important thing. And so put me ahead of every single test that has a priority over 80. Um, and I think, cross my fingers, that that's going to be improved in the future so that it's less of a less of a race to the lowest numbers. Um, and this forest priority flag is because we have some checks built in to be like, are you sure? And I was sure. Um, and then you wait for tests to come. Um, so I just wanted to go poke at a couple of websites to show you what I was referencing earlier, and then we're that's the end of my formal stuff. Um, so I went to Ceph or the Ceph GitHub page and picked a random PR whose name looked interesting or looked like it would cover the things I wanted to point out. Um, so this is a Ceph. Is that still is this? presentation or like the screen share is still good yeah cool all right so this is a, a pull request that one of our developers put up um and it has a few labels um if you get hub labels saying hey this applies to the core me basically meaning rados um and it needs qa it's a bug fix and then later um sage came along and put it in one of his testing branches saying hey this will be included in my testing branch um, and we have these checks that we run on every single pull request. Um, so we said, hey, the docs are fine. The commits are signed off correctly. We didn't change some modules. And it, um, we ran some API tests. And in particular, hey, make check passed. Um, and we can look at the details, which takes us to our upstream Jenkins server. And it's you know, it's a Jenkins server, which you may or not, may not be familiar with. If there's a problem, then the way you find out what the problem is, is you go look at the console output. Um, and you, this might look familiar to you. It is, you know, a compile build happening. Um, and then if we get farther down, then we will start seeing, hey, look, tests are running um, with, wow, I'm totally pulling a blank on what we run our tests with. Um, <laughs> But I guess it's just see, make, and make. Um, but a list of a bunch of the tests we have in the make check script or, or in the make check you know, system and that they all passed. And if one of them didn't pass, it would say so here. Um, and then once that's ready, in this case, it got pulled into a, an integration branch. But if you had wanted to build your own branch, then you would push it to this FCI that we talked about. And then you would be like, all right, um, there's this this thing called shaman.sep.com, which holds all our builds. And so we'd go look at the builds and say, hey, when is my testing done? Um, so Sage just pushed a couple more branches for testing. Um, but he also pushed some last night that I happen to have seen were there, which are which are available now. Um, 
And you'll notice that there's a bunch of different branches, or sorry, a bunch of different different builds for each branch. Um, and that's because we have a few different options we build against um, that are named here. So no TC malloc, we use the TC malloc memory allocator um, because it provides us some useful, useful functionality. But at least once upon a time, we needed to build it without TC malloc as well to run things like valve grind tests, which we do have a couple of. Um, and then we also build ARM64 in addition to x86 to you know validate that. And apparently it failed on that on one of these. Um, oh, and the Crimson project, which you may have heard about, also has its own its own builds to actually hit that stuff. Um, but in this case, we're saying, hey, the normal builds we care about for x86 for running in the test suite pat like succeeded. Um, and so we can run tests because we have all the packages that we need. Um, and then Sage ran a command, very much like the Duology Suite ones I've shown you, um, to schedule tests. And then we want to see those results. We can go to pulpito.ceph.com. And we have this long list of things. And, uh-oh, that branch you pushed last night failed on a whole bunch of the different suites. Um, this one upgrades from the Octopus branch to current master. Um, this one is testing the dashboard. This one is testing Ceph ADM. Um, where's the, oh, I guess it's scheduled before that. Um, eh, whatever. Anyway, um, so we can go in, but we like this list, all the tests that have run, and we can go look at a particular, um, and it tells us, you know, when they're in progress, how many have passed and failed. And we can, and, and it's color coded for green means all passed so far. Um, but this particular upgrade test did not do very well. Um, but this is all the individual jobs. And you can see here when you highlight it, the name is just all the fragments. And I think Niha is talking next week more about how to deal with this. But But that's sort of the basics of running Duthology jobs again, or running Duthology against Ceph and dealing with the results. So that's all, all I had. <laughs> um, any questions? Any discussion topics? I see Mark thinks we can use Valgar and DC Malik now, which is good. <laughs> Yeah, I've I've had some success. It's been a while since I've done it, but it uh it 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 worked last time I tried. Yeah. So I think we're well. I have talking about I have switching that one up. One question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I've seen a person sign as a file in QA suites. What's the meaning of that? I'm sorry. You've seen what is a file? A person sign. Not sign. a plus sign, but a oh, a percent. Percent sign. Ah, um. So, Josh, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, for some reason I don't remember the details. Someone wanted to make it so that you, instead of adding a combination, like, like a combination to the suite, that we just randomly picked on every single run one of them. So the percent sign means pick one of these and only one of these. Uh, that's the yeah, that's a dollar sign. Uh, versus the, oh, percentage that's the, dollar? the the default behavior, yeah. Oh, all right. <laughs> Sorry. So okay. percent is the same as having no percent there. It means just it'll it'll choose one of the OCML fragments in that folder. Um, the the dollar sign, if you, if that's included in the folder name, we use that. Oh, okay. I think mainly just for the distros, um, is to um, randomly choose a. Uh, uh, one of those YAML files and treat that folder as if it only contained one file. So it's, it's kind of a way to um, avoid a combinatorial explosion, but still get uh, good coverage for that kind of uh, option. In this case, uh, which distro you're on, which version of the distro you're running. And thanks for the link in the chat there, Sunil. Uh, there's a readme in the QA directory in Ceph.Git that uh, explains the suite structure and what all these different kinds of uh, files mean. Yep. 
Greg, is there an option to do code coverage with the tutology runs? Um, yes. <laughs> it, it doesn't work anymore. It worked <laughs> yeah. for maybe a couple of years, and um, it, it kind of bit routed since then. It, um, it requires a special build to enable that kind of coverage tracking as well. Yeah. So it could be resurrected, and that was a thing we were pushing for for a while, but no one's cared enough to get it back. Um, but the sort of in, the infrastructure's there. Yeah, I think it's an overhead on the build. Do we have to instrument Ceph uh, source code in order to do that? The that's how you usually want you. it to be. <laughs> but yeah. That's why you need the special build uh, for the, the compiler instruments the code with the uh, uh, coverage information so that the uh, runs can collect it afterwards. Is it a big deal? To do uh, the build or? To do the build. I mean, Josh, you spent a lot more time on this than me. Yeah, it's, it's not a tremendous deal to do an extra build. It's It's more whether the results would be helpful. Um, at the time when we had it enabled, we didn't particularly find the results that useful. There were kind of uh, clear areas that we uh, were covering better than others, and at, the, at that time at least. And so it didn't. It wasn't a very good good guide for us to uh, determine what we needed to test next, um, since we already knew there were uh, kind of different areas that we could improve coverage on. I see. But it might be interesting to see what, what that looked like these days. Like Greg said, the, the, the uh, infrastructure is, is it kind of in place. It, it, it could be refreshed and made to work. I'd imagine these days there are probably better tools for viewing that information too. At the time, it was a kind of very basic um, HTML website that the, uh, the, these kinds of tools created. Thanks, Josh. One more question. Is there an option to plug in uh, different IO loads and keep them running in between of the tutology tests? Sorry, to plug in different what and keep them running? Uh, IO uh, or benchmark tools, like cost oh. range. Um, yeah, I mean, we run all kinds of different ones. And um, they're mostly. Actually, I guess it depends on which ones. Um, so yeah, so we have we have a bunch of thing, a bunch of our things where we run a load generator. Us usually not Cosbench because we have our own specific things, but yeah, but like Cosbench I think is included in the RTW tests where we will what we were on some kind of benchmark or load generator as one of those context managers that, and then we do specific things to the cluster like add nodes or like add OSDs or take them away or run thrashers against at the same time. That's that's what that mechanism is for. Got it. Niha did some work uh, to make it so you can run uh, CBT workloads through Truthology. I don't know exactly how you can mix and match that with other stuff, but um, but at the very least, you, you can run cost bench that way if you really want to. Mark, do you want to yeah. explain what CBT is for anybody who isn't aware? Oh, oh huh? yeah, sure. <laughs> Sorry. So, so CBT, um, it, I guess the best way to describe it is it's sort of like a cross between VStart and Tuthology. Not as good at either as, at what they they are are sort of you know designed for, but um, kind of like a light version of a mix of both. Sort of, um, it can run benchmarks and then mix and match different uh, options for different uh, different benchmark options and iterate through tests that way. Um, I don't think we use most of that with the wrapper in Tuthology. Instead, we use Tuthology's ability to schedule tests, and it just basically passes a, a single configuration on to CBT. So in, in this case, for Tuthology, CBT is just kind of like a glorified wrapper around FIO or around cost bench or something else. 
Um, but like, but mean, they share in a market. It literally stands for Seth Benchmark Tool, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, so so there's there's some overlap between what Tethology does and what CBT does. The CBT is very much like just it's it's much stupider than what Tethology is. Um, so so in this case, um, like for for Tethology, it it just basically you use Tethology to specify all the different um, kind of uh, parameters that you want, and it passes those individually along to CBT, which then passes them along to whatever benchmark CBT supports, which are like Cosbench, HSBench, FIO, Rados Bench, that kind of thing. Thanks, Mark, for the info. No problem. So, Greg, since we have a little bit of uh, time left, um, I would suggest, unless we're planning to do this in a different uh, uh, technology tutorial, uh, maybe looking at a particular jobs YAML and just briefly going over that. Uh, I could pull one up. Like, I think Nihao is not. No, no, maybe not. <laughs> yeah, that might be a good one to do for now. Okay. Um, let's see here. Let's see. Can you still see this, or did switching windows on a break? We can see it, but the text is small. Yeah. yeah. That's good. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Um, what's today? Today's the 18th. Oh, no. You got to start with the, the username. Tethology first. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Give me something. Sure, 15 sounds great. Let's see. Um, all right, so here's a smoke suite, which ran in the past. Um, and uh, it's not quite enough. And we can look at the re summary and say, hey, stuff passed. Hooray. Um, but in particular, looking at a, partic at a specific job, um, let's see. So we had the original configuration. Um, and so the archive path is the folder we're in saying, saying, hey, here's where I want you to put the files when the job's done. Um, we're running against master branch. The description is the names of all the, the specific files um, and within the folders. Um, this is some internal glue. The job has a specific ID, which was assigned when we scheduled it. We want to run um, the, distro, the distro kernel. Um, log rotate is literally log rotate, and we're setting file, si file size thresholds for when that happens. Um, this, the log rotate is going to be a task that runs, or no, sorry, is I think runs inside of the set task, um, but there's a configuration for it. We're running on Smithy. The suite had a name. We want to kill the job when there's an error so it doesn't take up machine time. Um, the open stack stuff is basically unused now, but if we, but we have the capability to run inside of OpenStack clouds, and this is telling it what we need out of the machines for that, or out of the VMs for that to work. Um, this particular job ran against RHEL 8.3, um, and this overrides thing is is a way of gluing together YAML fragments that had um, different configuration options. But like, if we have a sort of base configuration, and then a specific test we want to run with a different one, we can we can put overrides in it. Um, so we're saying, hey, actually, I have no idea what the admin socket one is for. Um, but the Ceph config here is literally just the Ceph config options. Um, the log options here. So when a test runs, 
one of the things we do to, to validate that it succeeded is scan through and look for error messages in the central log that the monitors generate and feed out. But we ignore certain kinds of errors and so certain kinds of tests. Like when you're running thrashing, you don't care about errors that say, hey, like OSDs aren't down. Because we're like, yes, that's the whole point. We killed a bunch of OSDs. Um, some of the tests still maybe use set deploy or set ansible. So those have configurations. Um, let's see. Hang on. I got to go look at this. Oh, yeah. I guess this one was, in fact, a set deploy test. Um, Really? Anyway, um, and we're running Thrash OSDs and work units, apparently. No, there we go. That's the actual test run. There we go. Um, but th but this is all this is all configuration for if we happen to run those. Sorry. And the owner in this case is is a scheduled nightly job, but it could also be scheduled Greg F at, at wherever. Um, the schedule indicates that you ran Toothology Suite, and then it's actually just the username and the machine that, that it's on. Um, this nightly was run at priority 71 for some reason. Um, it's on three machines, one, two of which run servers and one of which runs the client. Um, it's running the smoke suite against the master branch. We cloned the suite. That's not that interesting. But here, okay, so when the, it was started, then we managed to lock three machines for it. We ran the, and then finally here we have the task list. So we ran the install task, which installs a bunch of packages. We ran the Ceph task. We ran set the Ceph fuse task, which, which since it doesn't have any specific config, would have mounted it on every client role. And then we ran the blogbench.shell. Um, I mean, so it's it's a work unit, but it's invoking a like load generator called and benchmarker called blogbench. And then that was it. Um, in terms of the tasks. So this would run when it finished, then we would go back to Ceph Fuse, which would unmount, which we, and then we'd go back to Ceph, which would shut down the cluster, and then we'd do cleanup, remove the packages. Um, so that's sort of the, so that's the configuration that it would have used. There's a one with even more internal stuff in it in the actual, in the actual config.yaml file. And then if you go look at the tuthology.log, We'll see, first of all, it reproduces the configuration um, and then starts telling you things like, hey, um, we turned on, we are checking the packages, we're checking our locks, and then here's that orchestra um, Python module we talked about, and it's doing a bunch of installation stuff. What do I actually want to look for here? Um, and then, um, you know, we would run more of the tasks, but eventually you get to the work unit task. And so it pulls down the work units and makes a directory and we eventually starts doing stuff. So th this is actual output from a um, from running it that the remote machine is giving us back. But we're actually like building the blog bench test, I guess, on, I guess on the clients. It's been a while since I looked at that one. And then eventually we run it for a bit. Um, so that's a particular job. Hyper fast <laughs> to work through looking at, at sweet results. Yeah, I guess one and one uh, thing you can see in the log is uh, each time you, you can see every time a, a task starts and stops. Um, by you can see what uh, it, you'll say like running Ceph or running this task. Uh, uh, it's like in particular, running running task is uh, like the phrase it uses. There's a bunch of like internal things that it does at first before it gets to the the tasks in the, your configuration. And then during teardown, it'll say like, unwind, unwinding task. Um, we're running the, the cleanup phase of that. We just unwind. Uh, I forget exactly what the phrase is there.
We uh, apparently it's not. It's okay. capital U. Just search for unwinding. There we go. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah. So. Yeah, you can usually quickly find where things broke by either searching for traceback or the first instance of unwinding. Yeah. Traceback is usually what I go for, but it depends. Um, oh, and then at the end, um, this is the summary, which is also printed in the summary.yaml file, but like if you're trying to debug, check what thing, a specific thing it says failed, and then go look for that. Yeah, but keep in mind it can sometimes be misleading that yeah. you see a wa health warning, but what actually happened was a bunch of the demons seg vaulted. Yeah. <laughs> and just to add on to the the YAMLs uh, or the configuration that we were going over, um, you know, uh, more than half of it is actually recreated by Tithology for that particular job, and the remainder is what actually was specified by the collection of YAML fragments that you can see in the description here that uh, Greg is highlighting. Um, yeah. A lot of the configurations often don't actually have any effect on the job. I, maybe uh, would it be helpful to uh, look at the smoke suite here and and see look at those YAML files to see how they uh, were put together? Yeah, hang on, I gotta figure out where I, the fastest way. Oh, I probably just have it in my home folder, don't I? Oh no, I've never run it. Uh, hang on. Did this say where it's cloned it to? I feel like it must have. But I don't remember where. Oh, do you remember where this is going to be located, Josh? Search for forward slash QA. There we go. Ah, oh, okay. Yes. So. There we go. Make this legible. All right. So we got a basic. T so the smoke suite has just one real folder. It's the basic smoke suite. Um, we have this cluster configuration. So we're running on three nodes. Um, with the OpenSAT configuration that I mentioned before, um, we are always running against BlueStore with the bitmap alligator. We are picking one of the distros we use randomly. And, ah, there we go. There's an extra one here. Um, we install it, and then we pick one of the tests, of which we have many. Um, That one was the CFUSE blog bench one. Which just consists of a list of tasks which are run Ceph. Um, this is actually outdated now because this would have been a configuration for file store, I think. Um, and, but so it's just the, you know, run Ceph, run Ceph fuse, and run the blog bench work unit was all that was required to specify that particular suite. Um, and then all the rest of it, when we generated this, was predefined from the existing this bit, <laughs> um, which is basically copied from the sort of standard, you know, it's just sort of part. It, it's just part of the infrastructure we have um, for this. Is what a basic suite will, will look like. So we're down to like three and a half minutes. 
any questions based off of that or anything else you've heard today or seen in the past. I just want to add to, to this that, um, you know, we have a sort of common conventions for how we lay out the suites. As you can see, there's a task directory, but you don't actually have to put all of the tasks in that directory. Sometimes there's located elsewhere, like in the SFS suites, we have what's called a begin.yaml, which is just a common thing that uh, specifies how to install Steph and start it. Um, and we also have a uh, special mount directory that adds a task for actually mounting randomly either the fuse mount or the kernel mount testing. Um, so there are certain conventions we try to follow, but uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. Look, it's a begin direct begin YAML. Ah, uh, yeah. We got, for instance, a bunch of extra packages that a bunch of the file system stuff needs. Yep. So we have to get installed. Yep. All right. Another quirk of have... the. Yeah, sorry. Just be no, thinking of the, one of the reasons why it's called begin.yaml is actually the something I don't think we mentioned was the YAMLs are actually. Uh, loaded in alphabetical order. So the order of the tasks actually matter, and one of the ways you can control um, the order in which the tasks are, are put in the YAML array is uh, is by using, a, you know, the, the, uh, alphabetically sorting the, the YAMLs. So begin would, of course, be first because it's letter P. Yeah, um, or a bunch of them, uh, I don't remember where, offhand, but a bunch of the suites have um, just numerically specify the folders. To yeah, the upgrades the have to do that. Yeah. Like the smoke suite that we were just looking at, the install task began with a zero, and that was to control having it um, be at the beginning of the task array rather than after the uh, actual work unit. Ah, uh, yeah, this zero and dash install one. Um, a bunch of the more bit of the bigger ones, though, will have, you know, tasks and work units and stuff. And these and just every folder name will be prefixed with zero dash whatever one dash. All right. Well, Great. everyone else has gotten go. Go. Yes. Yeah, sorry, a quick question. Uh, when you look at a test run, how can you tell if it ran with Ceph ADM? Uh, I think right now all the Ceph ADM tests are use that specific um, task to do the install. So you just look at the description and if Ceph ADM is in it or not. Mm -hmm. But I actually haven't worked with any of those. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm afraid yeah, I that's can't right, write right Right now, you look at the description, and it would include Ceph ADM in it. Um, in the future, once we've converted more of the suites to use Ceph ADM, I think you'd have to double check the actual configuration to, to see whether it's using the Ceph ADM task or not. Do you happen to know where one of those might be? We can look at real quick. Um, well, there's the video slash that. Ah, right. Oh, let's see here. You can look at the smoke suite there. Sorry, which one? A smoke. Oh, smoke rollers. Sure. Oh, there's another smoke. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Um, Start. Hey, it is. There we go. So, one of the tasks is set ADM. Awesome. Thanks. And if it's okay, I have a quick question. Uh, uh, 
Yeah. When you want to um, have an integration uh, branch, uh, if you want to uh, test uh, multiple PRs, uh, how would you do that? Um, so there's a PTL tool in the SEP repo that a bunch of people use, or you just manually pull them into a single branch and push them up to stepci.git. You actually have a uh, build script to do so. I forget what it's called. I use it on a daily basis. I can tell you probably in a sec. There's two. There's build integration branch in yeah. source scripts, and there's PTL tool. I think for building integration branches, I'm the only one using PTL tool. Um, build integration branch is the one more commonly used. So you read the. Um... You know, normal process for me would be you tag PRs with a specific name, say Weep, Yuri, blah, blah, blah. And then you pull all those PRs and run the script on that. And it'll actually create a Weep. Uh, I'm sorry. It, it'll create, yeah, Weep branch for you, which you can uh, push to CI to build. And then that's it. Okay, awesome. Thanks. Any final questions? All right, well, thanks for joining, folks, and we'll see you next week with um, Leigh Howe will explain how to analyze the results of a suite or dev. And now it's time for the forums meeting. So if you're here for that, I'll stick around. Oh wow, this is the same. Thanks everyone. <laughs> same thing. Sorry Thanks, for running over. <laughs>